Mike check, Mike check, one, two, one, two. It's your boy Dame Dozier here with a special edition of the Word on the Net podcast. I got the great director, filmmaker, and artist, but he's in his director bag, Mr. John Claw. Yes, sir. And he has the uh, writer and, um, how can we say, inspiration for his new film, by the name of Jerry. It's just Jerry the short film? Yeah, it's just Jerry. It's called Jerry. It was originally the Jerry Anderson story, and we all, because, you know, it's a team, so we all sit back together, and we decided, like, you know what? You give it that ring, it just need to be Jerry. All right, all right. But we know him as Jerry Anderson, former king. I ain't going to say what he's the king of, because he's just the king of his domain. Yeah. at this moment but um really interested to see this film really interested to hear the story um so jerry anderson and john claude welcome to the world on that podcast thank you welcome welcome thank you thank you thank you okay um make his own mr jerry anderson yes sir how you doing how you doing how you doing all right so um we got this film and you know it's about a story of your life you know Relatively fiction, nonfiction, real, all real, all real. Okay, so you, it, 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 I take it that you done seen some things in your time. A lot of things, and hopefully we get to learn, you know, a little bit of them things, but um, not really too much to spoil the movie, if uh, if we will. But let's just get a a, a short introduction of yourself, um, Mr. Jerry Anderson. Welcome again. Thank you. How y'all doing? My name is Jerry Anderson, Macon, Georgia. With me, just trying to live a life now. Been through a, a real patch of my life, but now I'm here and I'm doing things the right way now. Movies, books, movies, plays, some of everything now. And podcasts right now, you know? Yeah, podcasts. And I thank you for um, coming and, and sharing your story with us um, prior to this uh, movie screening that y'all headed to. Um, he has some, he has the family uh, and they drove up to Atlanta from Macon today. So um, we're going to have a, 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 a lovely conversation about the things that you've been through, your experiences, and where you're going from here. Um, so before we talk about this pardon that you got from uh, black president, Barack Obama. Um, let's just let's just see. Let's find out a little bit about your background. Um, from Macon, Georgia, originally born. From Macon, Georgia, originally born, straight out of Tunnel Height. Went to Via Zingham High School, Grammar School, Central High School. Went to Knoxville Community College for about a year, and just doing best making really all making. Okay. Um, so there's different parts of making that I heard of. I heard that there's a South making and there's a North making, and um, I get this this from some of your movies, yeah, John Claude. <laughs> yeah. But was it anything? Was it was it as territorial as it is, uh, say today? No. It's just back then. It was just making ten high players here, four here. It went territorial. Everything. Was, that's why I kind of see things kind of funny now. When I got out, I see all this. Crip blue and all kind of stuff going yeah. on now in the territory and that territory and that just that bothered me, but ain't nothing I could do about that. The youngster got to wake up one day. Right, right. Got to. Um, so community college, only one year. Yes. What stopped I, you from finishing? I was uh doing real good. I was getting a football player. Had a lot of offers. Go to win the NFL, but my, my girlfriend at my at that time had kids, but pregnant for me, and she called on the phone and said, "Jerry, you need to come on, you need to come on." <laughs> the man that I am, so I made the worst mistake in my life then. But at that time, I thought it was a good choice. I went home. Okay, what position you played? Wide receiver. Yeah, yeah, you got some height on Kick you. Kick off from punt return, man. Okay, you had some speed and some height then. Four three. Oh, oh, oh. Four three. 
Not not the Cat Williams four three hour zone. Don't <laughs> not, say that. not that one. Not that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a four nine with Cat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of cats say, hey, "Man, I got that four three speed," but that four three speed is very special. I don't yes, say yes, you know, yes, so if real. you know, you know. Um, so you came back home, and um, you know, to be the, the the be the father, you know, to to take care of your family and whatnot, and you started getting involved in some street business. Oh, I, I started, I was trying to get jobs. Uh, I couldn't get a job doing nothing. Police out the fire department, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, you name it, Sheriff Department, I tried it all. I kept missing by one or two points, but I passed the Sheriff Department test. But at that time, they were going to hire one minority and they hired a girl. Yeah. So they left me stuck out there saying, man, what can I do? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like that right now. I mean, I've, I'm an educated brother, and uh, I usually only usually get jobs through references. You got to know somebody, man, the way they, they be feeling these days. Mm-hmm. But I can only imagine. This was in the 70s? Yeah, that, that was the uh, late 80s? 70s, early 80s. Okay. Okay. And um, so, like all, um, of, you know, like a lot of men in our culture um, that – have to find a way to, to, to feed, uh, feed their family, you end up turning to the streets. Was there any other uh, skills or anything, any other hustles that you had before you pretty much got introduced to uh, the street life? No, sir. I was just, I was working at Georgia Power, but when that job ran, I, it left me out there naked. I couldn't, I for years, about four four years in a row, I couldn't find a job, couldn't get a job, and it just, I had to do something. And then, the opportunity came. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. People introduced me to it, and I was just selling stuff, and I thought it was legal. At that time, I thought it was legal. Come to find out, people told them people they had to sit me down and tell me what time it was. And they, and they sat me down and told me what I was doing, and I could go to jail for a long time, or I could get fit to rich. At that time, my family was doing poor. I was doing poor. I needed money. So the choice was, yeah, I'm going to go to jail forever. Oh, I'm going to be a rich man. So I made the choice to jump into it. Yeah. I mean, without uh, without there's no reward without any risk, my brother. So um, we here to learn from your story, but also, you know, uh, experience it a little bit with you. Um, who was the person that introduced you to the game? And um, can you give me a short story about how you, like, how you got introduced? I ain't going to call no names. Cause people might still want to sue these days, so it, it was a good girl that I knew. She knew a lot of people from out of Florida. And they would always come by the apartment and they were dropping off something every time. And I'd sit there and I didn't know what it was. I kept seeing this white stuff they kept sitting on the table and wanted to know what it was. So she had to go to the grocery store one day and she gave me about 10 bags of, she said, there's 10 bags of 25, there's 10 bags of 50. Every time somebody knock on the door, if they want a 50, you take the money first now. And then you give them, but don't let them touch nothing. So that's what I did. I mean, she come back. She hear what the stuff out and sold it all. I done got them, man, I'm feeling good. Man, I sold it all this white stuff. What is this? She will never tell me. So the guy there from Florida came and told us, you got to tell that man that we're going to stop dealing with you. You got to give him a choice to what he want to do. So she took me outside. She said, man, they call this cocaine. Rich man, hi. You can go to the judge, the lawyer, football player. Everybody do this stuff, man. Everybody, rich man, hi. But you can go to jail for a mighty long time. Do you want to take that chance? But the money coming really, really fast. The money now. coming fast, man. I'm seeing all that money popping in my mind. I done gave her all this money. Man, come on, man. I got to have that money. I'm broke. I ain't got nothing. Yeah. So I chose to, to jump into it. Okay, so... um. I, I, and I also would take it, being an ex-football player at the time, you probably was a little bit of her muscle on the side. Like, you you, you know, I, I would probably want to have you around to, you know, for the intimidation factor, if anything, even though you was uh, probably a little green to the game. Super green. You know, without really knowing what it is or, you know, what you exactly getting into all the way. But, you know, you got this stature about yourself. And, um, I mean, I feeling it just from your voice alone, you know, you know I, I'm sure – if, if you was to get a little aggressive or angry, um, you would be very, very intimidating. So I could see how useful at the time um, this person probably felt that you were while also taking advantage a little bit of you not knowing exactly what you was getting into. Um, so when you dove right in, 
what was the first time that you kind of just like kind of got addicted to the, the the fast money? I got addicted to the fast money the, the first time I started selling <laughs> money. I'm just making so much money, and um, people come knocking on the door all the time at night, and then people start just want me. We don't want nobody to put in our hand, but just cry and get high. On, I don't get high on do nothing, no cussing, no smoking, or nothing. So at the time, she was doing it or something. So if you're doing it, you don't want the other person to say you nothing. If they're doing it, too, you think they're peaching on it. Yeah. So that left everything in my hands. And to get the money and the stuff, and I'm passing it out and getting the money, and I'm watching the pile of them, pile of them, pile of them, pile of them. So. What's the most money you ever made in one day? You remember? Around the estimate? So we get a the ball most ball money, figure of what we talking man, about. Man, let me see. More money we might have hit out. I, I might have hit in by probably about ninety thousand in about six hours one time. Ninety thousand in six yeah. hours. <laughs> okay. And 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 mind you, this is in the early eighties. You know, a lot of folks may feel like how they feel. Ninety thousand, no matter what decade it is, I take it. Especially in six hours. Um, That's a lot today. And I've heard stories about the estimate amount that you was kind of worth. But could you give us a little bit of, you know, what's the most money you think you kind of had at one time? Or, you know. Ooh, it messed me a lot. What I going to tell you, what I, I would make it. When I started off, I was making three million, three million a week, and I broke it down because uh, you have to let everybody else eat with you. So if I make that money, nobody else is making gonna make the money. So I had a bad back. Well, I can let other people make money too to keep the police off of me. So then I started making a million five, a million two hundred fifty thousand a week. Oh my goodness! So you do the math on that. Oh my goodness! But uh, you were making it's, three million. A is week. your hands all right, Mr. Jerry? I mean, I'm I'm sure that like. Your hands cramped a lot, man, counting all that money. Yeah, man, you can but I stayed up for two, three, four, five days, count some more money, man. I ain't counting the ones that throw them in the corner and let them pile up and put rubber bands on the go and give them away. <laughs> I got tired of counting money, man. And I'm, I, I, I'm just to speak on one experience that I had where I had a, a $100,000 of somebody else's money in my possession. And, man, the nerves... <laughs> that that money brought to me, man. Scare you like that, don't? I could not sleep, man, because they. It was only one night. It was like, hey, I'm gonna come back in the morning, and I I, I could have counted that money like six times, <laughs> like all night. I just counted it, took my eyes off it, went back to it again, counted. <laughs> You know, Man. right before I gave it to him, count it, make sure it's all there. I don't want nothing to do with nothing. You know, I, I needed you working for me, and you like to count. <laughs> but what kind of stress is that like, man? You know, three million, like basically just dealing with that type of money, and you and you got all these people that that depend on you, but you also got all these people that may prey on you. Well, most I'm, I'm kind of like a wolf in a way. A lot of people fear me anyway, so I ain't never worry about nobody coming to see me. Cause if you come see me, we gonna tell you. I had four to five guys work for me, and I counting all that money. I got so tired of counting money. I got so tired of buying safes. I got so tired of burying safes in places that might still be in there. I forgot all about. So you got to stay up all night when everybody else sleep. I'm in the yeah. wondering, man, how they gonna come? What they gonna do? I'm always thinking about the police at all time. My mind stayed on the police. My mind stayed on worrying about my worrying about my people because I got to take care of everybody, and I had to do I had to do everything because I don't have nobody. I had at that time nobody went on my level with me. I had people could get in my ear and say, "You need to do this with that money. You need to do that with that money." So I was just letting it pile up. So let's talk about some good days, man. You know, uh, can you give us a story about a good time that you that you may have had? around that time when you was on top, um, whether it's a vacation or whether it was something that you bought. Uh, let's share a good memory. Um, it, you know, if there's a few, just pick out one of the good memories that you've had um, being on top and running running things and making. Well, one, I, I bought a boat one time, the whole 34, I heard 34 people, and I would take it out of Tobasaki and everybody come out there that Sunday. 
you cooking, you having fun, you on the boat, and the boat had, had music on, we dancing, and we out on the beach at Tobasaki and Megan, and we having a lot of fun, mm-hmm. people drinking and doing what they do, and we just had a great time that time. That was one of my fond memories. And you didn't really indulge, you know what I'm saying, you, you, you kind of always try to have to stay focused, I would, but um, you didn't really drink too much, nothing like that? I never drank, I never smoked, I never cursed. Oh, okay. Like, cursing? <laughs> No. Tell them about the whole team. Like the work for Jerry, you couldn't drink. You couldn't smoke. Yeah, I didn't lie drinking. You couldn't do none of that. If Jerry come to the trap and y'all out, they would be out there drinking. They'll hide all the liquor. Jerry come out there and tell them about when you bust all the bottles. How come out there? I don't lie drink because when you drink it, it knocks you off. Just that second for the police to come get you. So they used to always go back. Fill up a trash can that had full of Nickelodeon and all kind of stuff. And I had to put on my arm of fatigue and I sneak down, do the woods and come up and catch them. And, and I see everybody <laughs> go in the woods and pull the bear out of there, go to busting all of them. Bow, bow, bow. They, man, you know I don't like drinking, man. And send them out the one that's super drunk. You got to go home and lay down. Everybody else that's okay, you stay on there at the job and keep on doing what you're doing. But you got to take pay cuts when you catch them. Yep. Two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars a week. Got them take that out. Depending on who the drunk is. Uh, oh, okay. So I ain't learned it from you. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I just yeah. <laughs> five, five, five. Nah, nah. But um, yeah, man. That 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 is a important factor. But a lot of folks uh, fall victim to overindulging. Yes. And 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 and, and you know that's kind of the quickest way you could get caught slipping. Um, and especially when you got that much pressure on you every day. Um, so we spoke about one of the good times. Um, and then one of the, I guess that was a time you had to reprimand your, your team. But uh, besides actually the, the downfall, um, can we talk about some of the pitfalls um, in the game? Like, have you uh, ever got robbed? or One time... My mother-in-law, I was at uh, my mother-in-law was at the house. I had a safe in the house. They had two safes in the house. One had three hundred fifty thousand in it, and one had eighty thousand. Something told me two days before the move to three hundred fifty thousand. I took it out and went and buried it. I left the eighty thousand in. So she went to work that morning, and by five minutes after she went to work, some kicked the front. They kicked the whole one out and went in the house and, and looking for the big. So I knew where it was because I had took that person there before. And they went in there and thought they were going to get the big safe and end up getting the little safe. And what they didn't bother me about them getting the safe. It would bother me. It got me the most there. She had just left the house five minutes before that. Now, you think if they came in there at them five minutes, they going to have to do something to her. Yeah, now, they come yeah. to get that. And that would, really, that would affect them. That would really bother me at the moment. And it's always, you know, not always, but most, most of the time, it's going to be somebody that you know, man. Somebody that you're close <laughs> with. Yep. So, um, has the game caused you to have trust issues? No, not really. Cause I was, I got people that I don't mess with anymore. But I never, I know what I'm doing. I always knew what I was doing. I knew what I had to have. And man, you got something going. I'm gonna always know what I got. Even if you doing wrong and sneaking some or stealing some or selling some, you got to, My thing was the quarter. If my quarter is. Two hundred fifty thousand, a million two hundred fifty thousand a week. Yeah. yeah, I don't care. You make two hundred thousand. You can see your little stuff. I don't care because I got a quarter. So if you don't get my quarter, then I'm put them baseball bats on your butt. Then oh, I want to shoot a man. I, I would tell a joke today. You know how to kill a man? You, just, you put a baseball bat on the shit and go. He'll beg you to kill him. He'll do anything <laughs> you want him to do. You know how to kill people. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, man, I'm 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 grabbing my shins as you as, as you mentioned that. <laughs> okay. uh, let's talk about some of the surrounding areas. You from Macon, but I'm sure that this lifestyle took you a lot of different places. It took. I was in uh, what's the name of the college over there uh, with all girl college Spelman, oh, Spelman. What they were Mohawks right there. Mm-hmm. It was some projects you see it right across the street. I don't know if they still there or not. I was in Atlanta. I was. In Tennessee, I was in Alabama, I was in Florida, and I was in L.A. Okay. Philadelphia. And Philadelphia. Okay. Um, and this is kind of what the operation, operational in all these places. Yes. 
Um, but Macon was always home. As the house. Um, let's talk about. Uh, I have uh, information that you may have made uh, quite a bit of money in Philly before. Um, your first million, you know what I'm saying? Uh, is that safe to say? Yeah, well, I was laying Philly up till the Philadelphia Mall came. They came and hollered at me. They told me that they had heard about me. What I had to do from now on, I had to buy from them, and I had to get them half of everything I made, or else they were going out to show me what time it was. So they came and they left a car in the, in, on the side of the road with the, with the trunk up, and they told me they were going to come back the next day and get my answer. Mm. But go look in that trunk when they leave. So when I go look in the trunk, it's a, somebody in there with a bullet in there between their eyes with their eyes open. Later on that night, when it got dark, I told my car up, getting up out of here in the interstate, getting back to Macon. It was somebody that you knew? No, I didn't I didn't know that just somebody would let, let me know. Yeah, same This is what's gonna happen, yeah. Uh, if you don't Was it was it white guys, Italians? Uh, Italian. You know, okay. I ain't meet I ain't no mean the same guy in Prius that was running it at that time. Okay, okay. Yeah, man, uh, kinda sound like uh what's that, American gangster a little bit. Okay. Um so in these other places that you had things going on, what was the place that you probably your second home? What 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 place that you would call your second home? Was it out in L.A. or it was L.A. It was L.A. L.A. was my stomping ground. I, I started in L.A. That's why I learned. They told me if I can come to L.A. and if I could do it at that time, L.A. was the hottest spot in in the country. If I could do it in L.A., I can go anywhere in the world and do it. So I was out there for about three and a half years and. And I name the store I can tell you about him. I mean, whoever was out at them times, I was movie stars. I was I was got with the guy in the two on them. Cause you know that's you, you got the the candy that the movie, nah. the movie stars and the movie yeah, makers. The candy. They yes. love. Yes, yeah. I don't call no name, but I was the singles, the the the, the, the baseball actors, players, whoever basketball. They were coming to their house, baby. and I was doing. I was putting it out there too. Now, um. What's the guy who played for the Lakers? Ain't he from? Um, Norm Nixon. Norm. Norm Nixon. Mm-hmm. Married that beautiful woman, Debbie. Yeah. I missed Norm by inches. That one, I didn't ever hold a lead of high school because I, I was 7, 24, 7, man. But Norm was at the best. I've been knowing Norm all my life. And Norm was at the basketball game. Some of my people had went to the game because they, they didn't think I knew him. So they asked him, No, you know Jerry? He said, Man, that's my own way yet, man. Tell him to come in. When he come to the I heard Jerry, he won't see you, man. Get in the car. I go back down, but he had left. Yeah. Yeah, Norm Nixon was a, a bad man. To, uh, yeah. Well, I ain't going to say it until Magic came. No, nah, but he was the man for the Lakers, and yeah. then they brought Magic in for them to pair up. Definitely. Well, yeah, Norm Nixon was. He was telling y'all Definitely. Missing. No, what y'all were missing was uh, what got Norm out of the Magic had Debbie at that time. Norm took Debbie. Oh. Somebody, somebody had to go then. Oh. <laughs> I ain't know nothing about yeah. that. Yeah, we know that Magic had a weakness for them ladies, but now, yeah. I, now that's an exclusive. I, don't, I, I, I didn't hear so, that. So Magic Johnson was with Debbie and then Norm Nixon Mac, took Debbie from me. Yeah, that country boy got him. And yeah. still married to so, this day. So you yeah. took my position, but I took your girl. Yeah. All right. All a lot right. of people don't know Norm and Debbie's son is an actor on uh, Snowfall. Yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Yep, Norm and Debbie's son play on Snowfall. Okay. Um. So L.A., second home. Um. That's kind of far away. I, I can imagine that there was a a, a run in into a, a, a two, you being a wolf and all. Did anybody yeah. ever get you get, get the best of you out there in L.A.? I've always been a good guy. When I first got out there, they would tear me up first. They would tear me up because I, I was green. They, my my boss said, "Let them skin him till you learn." He always tell me, "Don't let them touch the stuff, cause they're gonna switch on you." So when he come in in the morning, I'd have he said, "Let me see the stuff." He's the first thing he asked for. I give it to him. Bacon soda, bacon soda, bacon soda, bacon soda, bacon soda. He threw it on the table. He said, man, what I told you, man, don't let them people turn that stuff. They would tear me up with it. Because I always let them, you know, how many they keep picking. I don't want that one, I don't want that yeah. one. So, but my thing was I run the Crips and the Bloods out there. But I was, I always been I always been smooth. So, they fell in love with me quick. They were always deal with me. But the rest of the guy, when I left and broke away from them for about a good week, they come shot the house up because the other guy I was doing, we were trying to treat them bad. I got my own spot out there, and they would come to me. I always just been a good guy. People always 
knew that I'm gonna come at them right. Tell them about that time you went out there and you had that red on. That when I, I was at, uh, I went on the wrong side of town. I had on all red, and I was in a red, uh, not a Suzuki or night by a little red Samurai. And Joker caught me, I was at a Jiffy. Joker caught me coming up out of Joker slapped me so hard, pow, man, it butted about 10 on. I can get down, but I said, hey, no, I'm going to see what. This. So they really tear me up, so I started talking. I said, what's up, man? What y'all doing? So they hear my voice, and they go, oh, man, where you from? I said, I'm from Georgia, man. He said, man, you get a pad that time, man. You don't come over in that thing, man. Don't come on no way, <laughs> no nothing, no more, man. Get in that car and get up out of here. Mm, I got out of there. You could have told me you was from Cincinnati. Hey, man, I play for the Cincinnati Reds. No, they, they, that yeah. voice, they, they love to hear you they talk in California. <laughs> when you talk up there, they just say it again, say it again. They love our voice up there. Yeah, man. Good old uh, country south, man. Yeah. When I, when I went out there, man, um, I missed the sweet tea and and the, the lack of uh, grits, man. You know yeah, none of that out there. Collard green grits, none of that stuff. They don't know man. nothing about no real they, they country still, living out there. They still man. look like the Sabnes out there. Yeah, man. But it, but, but but it's a nice vibe out there, man. Yeah, no great. Doubt. I love it. It's a nice vibe out there. Um, So you cop back to Georgia. Um, And you said L.A., you, you, you know, got licked out there. You know, you know, you learned some hard lessons. Right. But I'm sure, you know, um, I let's just say they ungreened you a bit. Yeah, a lot. And you came back to Georgia, and um, and that's when everything started to really, really build uh, to another level. I went to Philly for real. When that happened, what I just told you happened. I came back to Georgia, so that's when I started. I'm going to put me out there. I started free sampling because I'm 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 top of the line now. I'm thinking like I don't know where. So I put out some stuff in Georgia that make them. And everybody started loving it. Next thing you know, I'm making fifty thousand a week. Next thing you know, I'm making a hundred thousand a week. Next thing you know, I'm making two hundred fifty thousand a week. The, the briefcase was a briefcase first. The bigger briefcase, the suitcase turned to a safe, and that's the money just started pouring in. And people, the girl that taught me the game said, "Look here, man. Do you know how powerful you are?" I ain't thinking like that. All I knew was I got money. She said, "Man, everybody won't make them, but everybody's scared of you. They don't want to come take you on." So I'm thinking, I said. Mm. Okay, I'm getting to see what she said. I am powerful. People won't come get me, but they don't know how to come to me. Cause I'm gonna break them down if they come up and uh, and try to take me on. So I even had people from Atlanta would come down there, follow me around. Here, guys in prison, I admit, I used to come down to make it just to watch you walk through the mall with you and watch you and see your style. I just want to, we just watch. I had a lot. Mm, okay, I'm glad you didn't step to me, cause they have about four, five jokes around me at all the time. And if it's trouble, we finna tear it down. I heard that you hired a worker, and you gave him a car and an apartment, and you saying all oh, this money per week, but they have uh, five thousand dollars a week. That was my thing. My lead man would get six thousand. My package man would get five thousand. My lookout man would get three thousand. They job was to. The lookout man stand on the corner. Look, the package man said the package. My lead man was over everything. I'm gonna get you an apartment. Furnace through, I'm gonna get you a car. I'm gonna put the sound system in the car for I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you everything because you work for me. Because they had a thing that when they said Jerry boys, you got what they want. I take them to the mall, whatever, buy them all the clothes, all the rack. All, I just kept them up. I took everybody on my job. You work for me. You ain't got no business being broke. I'm gonna make sure you're all right. Whatever you need, you got. And, and, and you being the, the nice guy, but also a wolf, you know. Uh, I'm sure that's also because you took care of the people around you. You took care of your community. Um, can we speak on any community things that you pretty much, uh, that, that, that you know, uh, did you build any basketball courts or? Yes, I do. Uh, for some reason, they did a lot of little kids to play ball on Sunday. So I went and got a basketball. I put the basketball goals on the basketball coat, come up there and put it. Police would take them down. I go back and put it up there again. Every Sunday I had little kids. I had grown kids, older people out. We'll shoot basketball all day, but the police would come up there while we playing, take the goal right back down. I go right back out to K-Mall, buy them, put them right back up. The more, the faster you take them down, the faster I'm going to put them back up. You don't have no right to tell a little kid he can't shoot ball or tell people they can't play ball. This 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 playground, man. So he finally left me alone with that. So, mm -hmm. anything else basically on the community uh, as far as community based? I took it over. My thing was to take it a whole community. I had people that want to go to college. I had people. I had 
people was coming up to me saying the Coach they hooked them and spun all this money with me. They didn't have no rent. They didn't have no food. The kid had no clothes. I would let some of my boy take him in the car, take out, pay the rent up three, three months. I would buy him clothes. I would buy him food. Cause if you come to spend your money with me, and I got too much money. It's my job to take care of you because you're home and I spun up all the money. You got all these kids. It was my duty. Anybody that want to do something, you got a job, you needed a car, I would buy them a car. Whatever they needed to make it was my job. To, I got too much money, man. So I yeah. got it. You, you spend it on the people, so that's what I did. I took everybody. Yeah, I took care of everybody. Churches, Ooh. gave the preachers, built <clears> churches. <throat> well, you know, take care of the people, and the people, gonna, um, they're going to protect you. Right. right. And that's all why. that money you used to count all the ones. They would just ride around and give the ones away. Yep, that was my thing. He on the state with them people out there with them signs. A man, I can never forget this. He was on the white guy on the sign on the interstate with a sign saying, "I work for food." I remember, I remember BMW. I pull up, I jump, I, I grab six stack of ones. I go up to him for the six thousand dollar. I give it to him as I'm going to the car. He don't know he. <laughs> take it through the sign now. I see he hit him for the hotel room. Now he can go get him a room and lay down. Now he got six thousand dollars. Yeah, man. Um, so again, good guy. End up having a little too, well, not even a little too much, way too much money. And you got, got to deal with it a whole lot of different ways. Um, took some losses, but also looked out for a lot of different people. So. Um, how did the downfall start? Like, was it somebody that was inside your operation? Was it somebody that was jealous? You know, what, did you just get to a level to where you were set up? It always jealousy in the empire. It was jealousy. A lot of guys, some, I ain't gonna never tell it. Some guys stole the key and swear somebody else found it, but all, I didn't pay no attention to them. Then they'll come back back and sell it somewhere else. I knew of my stuff, cause I, I had my stuff was totally different from anybody, anybody else. So a lot of guys don't know how to be, they weren't chiefs. They were Indians, but they wanted to be chiefs. So a lot of guys got jealous, and, and that what really started. They started slipping on the side and selling stuff, and then they started getting knocked off and instead of telling me what was going on so I can get them a turn and help them out. They would keep it to themselves and they would start telling stuff about me on, on the slick side and that's how I started crumbling down. Because you getting caught out there selling your own stuff. They ain't may let you go, but you got to tell everything you can about me. Tell what, try to find out where I got the money and where I got the stuff and what I'm doing. So that was, that's how everything started coming to a fold. Now did you get caught with something petty first? And then that kind of started the cycle of the folks kind of like getting on to what's going on or or was it just one big thing that... No, I never got caught petty. Cause I, had, I had a rule. My rule was always one thing. We, it's a hundred ways to do something, but it's only one way. Only one right way. As long as you keep it in the grind, yeah. keep it the way you are right. See, police ladies, they, don't, they ain't going to never dig in the grind and look for nothing. And I had to keep coffee beads in there too so the dog can't smell. The dog don't like to smell that coffee, so he ain't finna find that. So I kept it in the grind. I kept it. Well, if they follow my way, we never got secret indictments, none of that kind of stuff, because we were doing it one way, and we were doing it the right way. But, and um, unfortunately, that type unfortunately, of life, yep, unfortunately. Ends, it, it ends in two ways, and the bright side is, is we here to have this conversation today, my brother. Yeah. You know, right. you, you're a survivor. Um, you did what you had to do. Um, a lot of things, you know, um, a lot of bad things do come in that life. But, uh, again, at least you're here to share your experience, to um, motivate people in the right ways from your experience. And, you know, you, um, you're making yes. a movie out of it now. I, I would like to say I don't never glorify nothing, but I just tell it how it is. I don't like glorifying, but I'm going to tell you from the top exactly what time it is. So you, if you're in that game, you know when they come get you, man, you got to be real. Because they're going to come get you. You don't survive when you're selling dope. You going down sooner or later, just a matter of time. Yeah. Because somebody going to get you. One of the people that work with you, somebody going to get you. Or somebody going to go and do something wrong. And to say they self, they're going to get you up. So. And um, where were you? Were you in, in at home or were you on the road when they um find, when they finally the walls came crashing down? I was... Getting ready to 
come or go to Alpha Real in Atlanta. One of my workers there got locked up. He was finna get ready to get out, and I would take him some money and go up there and see him. And one of my friends, one of my workers called me and said, I want to ride with you. But I didn't know he had got knocked off the night before. Now this guy was like, he was like a brother to me. I, would, I believe I, I, I trusted him. He told me he wanted to ride. He never wanted to go there before. Every time I asked him, he wouldn't go for nothing. But all of a sudden, he called me at 4.15 in the morning at night, and I'm going, my brain saying something wrong. Yeah. But uh, he, because who he is, yeah. made me relax. And what really got me back to my ex-wife, he said, out of all your boys, he the only one I trust. And that made my guards go all the way down for him. And all the while, he had, they was already sat up and all kind of waiting on me. He had got knocked off his job to get me to a destination. He got me there. They came from everywhere. Man. Yeah, man, that's... That like you said, that's, that's definitely a part of the game. If you so if, if you so happen to be in the dope game, you can expect jail or the the cemetery, grave. Yep, or the cemetery. And um, how much time did did, did you get? It gave me seven counts. First count with life. Second count with life. Third count with life. Fourth count with five years. Cause that's all they could give me on that one. And the fifth, sixth, and seventh count with twenty five. Yeah, it's definitely a blessing uh, to be talking to you today, uh, sir, and, and for you to be sharing this story. Um, and um, how much time did, did you do before receiving the pardon? I did 28 years. Oh, man. All right. Um, within that time, you said you end up running into people you work with, rivals, I, I can imagine. Um, but can you talk about like the experience in prison and how did you survive? It always been my mental in prison. I didn't do what everybody else do. Everybody else in, in prison, they like to play domino chess and play games. And me, my thing was always get me a step bench and go in the corner. I worked out by myself all the time. And I always kept my mind on the streets. I never thought about prison. I didn't play games. I didn't do none of that. And I'm going to work out and I'm going to think home and all the time. That's how you don't get institutionalized. A lot of guys in there coming there dumb and they're cussing each other out, playing all day long, they get institutionalized. A lot of them. But I kept myself away from that kind of, from that life. I only meet by three, four, five, five people. I, I would go to prison every three years. I'm going to go to a different prison. I don't want to meet nobody but a guy he got to be in. See, I'm in my 30s and 40s then, so I had to meet a guy in his 50, 60, or 7. I want to talk to older guys because they're going to tell you something good. Yeah. Yeah. And um, before I, we talk about the the part and you being released back into the streets, uh, I want to bring it over to you, John Claude. Um, being from Monroe County, mm -hmm. Foresight right outside of Macon, right? Mm -hmm. um, have you heard anything about Jerry's story prior to making this movie? Prior to making the movie? Nah. So... Um, but since the movie, I get I get tired of people pulling me to the side to talk about Jerry. And it just happened so much. Like I had one dude, like I grew up next door to them, and uh they was I remember when they was poor. I remember like in the back of their house, like they used to have their clothes in the woods and stuff like that, on the trees and hanging up to dry their clothes and stuff, and then I remember all of a sudden it wasn't like that no more. And they they haircuts had changed and they were different. And I remember when one of them went to jail and his name was uh, Eric. And I remember seeing him one day and he walked up to me. He said, man, you doing that Jerry Anderson movie? I said, yeah. He said, man, my name Eric. He said, add Jerry. Do you remember? He was like, I did time for Jerry. He was like, yeah, man. He was like, oh, that time I went to jail and was locked up for a while. He was like, yeah, that, I was working for Jerry. And I'm like, dang. That's a lot. <laughs> Jerry said, that's a with no cap, like people come up to me so, but really, like, um, you know, like my mama came to me and told me, he was like, you know, you know, uh, Jerry used to come to Forsyth, they used to come down there with all them cars and they come to the baseball field and they come down and, and you know, everybody just tell me the stories that I had. And I'm just like, I never heard of Jerry. But a lot of times, like just doing my films, I don't really be knowing, um, I don't be knowing what film I'm gonna do, I just be letting. Letting God lead, and if it makes sense, I follow because I have so many opportunities. 
But really what it was is I have a cousin. He had hit me up with like, man, you heard about Jerry Anderson? He was like, man, you need to do a movie with Jerry. And I was just like, I listened to him, but I had never heard of Jerry. And I was so used to people coming up to me that what he was saying really was, it didn't mean too much. <laughs> and man, maybe like a week later, Jerry's wife, she she executive producer on the film. She helped us out to do this a lot. She was the first person to reach out to me. Her name Ernestine Anderson. She hit me on Facebook and uh, she was telling me about her husband, gave me a number. So I hit her up and they told me the story. And I was like, yeah, that sounded like something I wouldn't mind being interested in. But I hear a lot of good stories. But the only thing that made me jump on it was I knew it was from God because my cousin had just randomly told me about this same person. Yeah, it was it was coming to you one way or another. Yeah, it was just meant to come. And and I I had asked Jerry, I was like, y'all know Jamar is there, know y'all. And they were like, uh-huh. I'm like, okay, no, Jerry, because I wanted to see if he had talked to them and talked, because I was like, it's such a coincidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, um, trust issues on Tubi right now. Yeah. Um, guy, I like the way that you put people in the community. And got everybody involved on the movie, yeah. and um, and the community brought you back to brought you to your next idea, your next venture. Right, because that's right. how Jerry them found me. Right, because I filmed Trust Issues in making. Jerry and his family saw Trust Issues and were like, "This is the dude that did that movie." Okay, let's hit him up, man. You know, and, here and we go. a man of the community keeping the story, you know, in the community, but you know. Y'all are sharing this story for the world now. It's a whole new world with this digital um, uh, distribution on movies and things like that. So uh, I'm sure that this is just the beginning. This is just the the outlier, uh, if you will, of the movie that can possibly be um, a mini series, um, um, books. Uh, Jerry, are you um, are you working on an uh, actual book of the story? I got a book out right now. What name of that book, Mr. Anderson? King of Cocaine. You can pull it, you can find it on uh, Amazon. Amazon. Yep, King of Cocaine. Okay. And um how long that uh how long uh has that been out? And um It was out before the movie. The book came out before the movie. Right. He even did a couple plays before, <clears throat> did a soundtrack before. So it's like the film, like where we at now, all this just came from all those seeds that him and him and his wife and his team planted. To lead to this point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The Life and Times of Jerry Anderson, King of Cocaine. Paperback. Y'all go get that on Amazon. Order your um But yeah, uh so y'all had the the book out and now it's just time to have it out. Basically more of a story. How uh how was it when when you found out about Jean Claude, how did you find out about him, and how was it when y'all when y'all first met? My my wife, Ernestine, and she told me about Jean. She said, "I know a guy in Atlanta named Jean Claude. Hey, if I be getting him to do this too, let me get in touch with him and, and bring him down here and, and let you talk to him." We we rehearsing to play Joan and Potten Hill came through the door. We went in the room, all of a sudden, and we started talking. And it kind of just clicked. Clicked. Everything jail. I could just tell I knew that. See, it'd be so much I'd be wanting to do. But like I said, I'd be letting God direct me and lead me. And I know, like, and I'd be wanting to include myself. Like, whatever it is, it got to be bigger than me. It got to be It got to be something that can take us all to another level. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And, like, what Jerry had, that story, you know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of people glorify, like, you know, the hustle and the the $3 million or the the lifestyle and the Barack Obama. But really, it's like, man, you don't hear too many people go down and be gone this long and then come back and still alive. You know what I'm saying? Still can tell the story. Don't Ain't told on nobody. Still can go home and stand up like a statue and people still come speak to you and love you. And he don't glorify it. You know what I'm saying? Now he's showing people the right way to do it. He's speaking to the youth. Uh, what's the name of that group y'all got with the, the group of guys that stuff y'all be doing? It's group. What is it called? Something? Yeah, the, the Tim Knight Brotherhood. Yeah, Tim Knight Brotherhood. I got my foundation out now. 
Jay Anderson Youth Foundation. So I'm trying to build that up too so I can get kids and bring them up to a football game, basketball game, and try to get them off that street. You have to show these kids that it's another way of life because a lot of kids ain't never lived making make it, never they ain't been through nothing. When you take them somewhere just to another town and they like they don't believe it man if this you know, when they see stuff they ain't never seen before it amazed them so if you can take them out of that bad atmosphere and put them in a good one man yeah change the lives right sky's the limit at that point right. and i think that that just comes from the protection of uh ex-slaves right um a lot of folks all over the world they don't really leave the porch they don't really leave the, their hood. They don't leave their, their uh, city, town. And for the most part, it's because at one, at one point, you went too far, you might end up disappearing and never be seen again. That's right. But also, but also um, when you take the kids and you show them that there's more to just their neighborhood, more than to just their town, you know, that can set a chain of reaction of, of, of events to to make, you know, the, them be greater than who right. they probably will end up being. And um, so I applaud that. Uh, I want to play, I'll pull up this picture right here. Um, now this is uh, you and um, actual shackles. They were taking me out to Atlanta and they found me guilty that day. And they, they were taking me to Atlanta and shoot me off to Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay, and that's where you did the, most of your time? No, I, I told you where I go, I'm going to do three years. Every, I went to at least about seven, eight prisons, three years, three years, three years. I'm always on the go. A lot of guys sit in prison for 30 years, 28 years, 20 years. I didn't like to sit still in the same spot like that. It's best to move. I, will, I always like to be on the go. All right, so let's talk about um, this pardon and your return to the streets, your return to freedom. Um, how did that go about? Um, was there plenty of letters, I would presume, that was written to anybody that would care to listen? But um, were you the only person writing letters? Uh, could you tell us about that? I, I didn't write a letter. But President Barack Obama, at his second term, they called it clemency important. He could pardon you or he could, or he could give you clemency. So he, they come on and tell every prison, there were 38,000 prisons, 38,000 men had drug charges at that time. He take come on and tell everybody to file a motion. You can send him a motion, and he'll he'll look at your he'll look at your your time. Make if you doing good in prison, if you been all right, you been doing the school, you been doing anything. He could pardon you. So that what he did. He at that time he he looked at my he looked at mine out of. Like I said, out of 38,000 people, only 1,715 people got to be a pardon before he left out of office, and I was one of them. And with me, he called me, they had to call me to the phone because my counselor, they would come through. Every time he pardoned somebody, they come through the walk through the cells and go to your room and tell you you've been pardoned, you can hear jokes in the crying. And they, but they only had like six. They were going to do six, or uh, how you call it? They were doing six lists, and you make that list, you own, it might be eight people this week, ten people next week, five people, but it gonna, he only going to pour so many people. Out of Atlanta, out of every prison, he going to pour so many people. And, man, I'm thinking that there's two more lists left. And they called me. I saw a walk that I'm talking to this man about 40, he's been in there for about 46 years. Me and older guy, me him talking. And when I see her come through the door, she come through the door, she got six letters in her hand. She go around to this room, that room. She walk past my room. I say, oh, she ain't got me this time. And miss me again. So, But it's a guy that named Jerry around and got the same name I got. <laughs> but he was there for a gun charge. So she get out and she see him. He iron people clothes for him. They pay him for iron. She see him and said, I'm looking for you, man. Come here. He said, what? She said, I got a point for you, man. So so. He said, Crack, he's like, I ain't there for no crack. He's out there for a gun charge. Who you looking for? You looking for him and pointing up that man. I'm, but I'm, I'm, I see him point. Yeah. And my eyes scratching. Now she said, What's your name, Jerry? Jerry she's come Anderson. Here. Yep, she's come here. The other Jerry. The other Jerry. The other Jerry. <laughs> so she called me down and she said, uh, What's your name? Say your number. 
Or in prayer, you ain't you a nimble. Yeah. Eight two nine forty four zero two zero. She, you the one I want to see. She take me in the office. She said, I can't tell you right now, but your turn is on flying right now. So she she wants you to stay in the unit because she got something to tell you. I said, tell me what? Don't go outside. Whatever you do. Man, I ain't trying to hit up. You ain't yeah, you trying. can't share that news with nobody. They don't want to hear that. You might not yeah. make it out. Man, I went right outside. I wasn't studying that stuff, man. So when, when I'm outside, it's a white guy come out there and say, I don't know whoever Jerry Anderson is, but they just gave him a, he just got, he, he got Clemens. So I'm out there lifting weights with some of my friends. I'm going, I can feel my body go, ooh. So when I get back in, she said, I told you not to go outside. Your turn ain't going to make it in time. She told me to tell you. Come on, go to your room. Who well, another lady take me to my room? She said, "You've been granted. You've been granted Clemens by Barack Obama." I hit the floor. I'm crying like a two year old. I'm, like, oh, I'm crying. I'm asking, "Can I hold him?" My all kind of stuff. I'm so happy. I'm happy and I'm crying. They said, "Man, when you get out of, you make sure you do right." But we got something for you out of town. Somebody want to talk to you. So I'm thinking it's my attorney. So when they call me, they bring me out the town, take me out, stay in the room, give me the telephone. I say hello. Mr. Anderson, President Barack Obama on the phone. Oh, man. He said, man, he said, look at him. Them people didn't want me to let you go, man. They, 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 the whole time, everybody down there was telling me, anybody see if you do not let you go. Anybody see if you. He said, man, but you know I'm a president of, I'm a president of second chance. He said, man, I'm going to give you a second chance because I've seen you fire. You've been doing everything good in prison. I think you deserve a second chance. But these people do not want you out of there. Whatever you do. Man, don't let me down, man, because he pissed home. I don't want them. I don't want you back in prison. People saying, I told you, so don't let him back out. He said, man, whatever you do, you stay scrounged, Mr. President. I sleep under the bridge, whatever I got to do. I'll never come back to prison again. All I need is a chance. He said, all right, man, I'm going to give you a chance, man. I'm, 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 I'm granting that. I said, woo. Wow, man. Because it's crazy. Look, so, so Jerry telling y'all, but tell him how many times. Y'all hadn't been put in and sent stuff. Like how many times you had been denied, Jerry? I had put in 350 motions, but I had a, a, a Jewish back then, a mega name by the name of Jewish Wilbur the Wood. And man, he was hard on me. He told me no matter what I sent, even if it's right, he still gonna deny it. So he kept shooting every motion I had. Over 350 He kept times, turning them down, yeah. turning them down, turning them down. Had a motion that should have been. I got two cases up in the, in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal right now. Everybody can go home over my case. But I couldn't go on with my own case. Two of them. So really what was going on was, so Barack basically sat back and looked through the paperwork and was like, so special. What, what's going on with this Jerry Anderson person? He's seen how many times Jerry had been turned down and everybody was saying, oh, no, 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 not him, not him, which made him more curious. See, everybody didn't get to talk to Barack. Yeah. So he he called Jerry to let him know, know what you got going on and why nobody wants you to get out. But I'm gonna let you go anyway. Don't make a fool of me. And I even go to, for it to say I had a attorney named Margaret Love and another attorney named Ashley Deddendrop. My but I had a, one of my co defendants was in the he had he had got out he had he had, he had time he cut his time they let him out and he was going down to Florida. To, to the, he was in Florida. He got him going back to a reunion with some of them guys he was locked up with, and he was sick. He didn't want to go. He kept saying he ain't gonna go, but God made him go. When he got down there, he met my first attorney out of D.C. This the best attorney in the United States. He me, he go down. And he tell me she. He he talked to her about me. And she said, "Okay, I look at this case and send me a paperwork." And he sent him my paperwork, and she said, "No, nah, I don't want to do it. I, don't, I ain't gonna do it." Yeah. So, but she called another attorney that I had as a friend of my wife, and the attorney told her, "Man, they call him Robin Hood. Man, all he do is take everybody." She he, she started telling her all kind of stuff that will have that idea for the neighborhood and how people still looking for me to get out. So then she called him back and said, "I take the case." I mean, she used to work for, she was, uh, she was Bill Clinton partner attorney. She was Reagan partner attorney. So she knew all of them up there, but Megan had already sent some up there telling them all the, all the judges up there, they, they was illegal. They went up there and said, don't, not jail, not jail. She find out. She went down there and lit them up. Told them up, y'all, you know you're violating already. Now. So what she already knew by them not accepting what Megan had told me to do. Yeah. But it was, like I said, four them in two lists, but it was one list out of the list I told y'all I was on. And come to find out, there no more lists. I made that last list. Yeah, he, he part Jerry like his. 
his last few yep. days in office. I don't think he had but like two days left. When he hit yeah, you. yeah. When they, when the last, it was like the last month he was on the spree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want to, I just want to praise God right. for a black president for second chances for overlooked um, justice, but not necessarily justice, but just like again, just the second chance of of, of freedom and and what Barack Obama. Not only as a symbol, because uh, I I defend just the idea of a black president, right? Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of folks will say president really ain't do nothing for us and things I of that nature. Say that. But this story right here, and I know other stories, and I know of other things that I've defended, but I've never met someone directly that was affected by a black man being in a position to make a change and other people telling them not to do it and they just and he going ahead and doing it anyway. Yeah, thank what, you. Whatever whatever you know, whatever God put in his heart to believe that you you deserve that second chance and the, and the go above and beyond as far as to not take the recommendations of the people that was telling him, you know, to not to take that chance on you that he was going to regret it. Um that's just something that I that that's very honorable, and again that that's God, yeah. And it's also the 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 blessing that Barack Obama was not only to you, Jerry, but to us black people, t- just to believe, just to have the uh, now, because we never really thought we would see it. Never. Yeah. You know, and and even when you seen it, there was a lot of things it was like well yeah but he just uh just this or yeah it ain't doing that there was a lot of you know talk but i'd say man that was one of the most important things to actually change the uh trajectory of black america is just by actual the symbol of change that barack obama was don't be for barack obama i won't still be sleeping on them steel bed right now because it took that black president when nobody ever gonna pardon me i know that Go up, put Barack Obama there. I say you put him there for me. Don't be here for him in that office. I don't get a I'm still there with them three life sentences. 28 years. 28 years. Blessing to be back, man. So now, uh, man, that, that's that's a touching story, man. I, I, I thank you. And I want to ask you about some of the things that you had to get used to about being back out on the streets. Uh, what's the first thing you did that you, what's the first happy memory I mean obviously after seeing your family and things like that but um I mean because you don't drink you don't smoke you know you don't you ain't really the indulgent type but how did you celebrate I take you from the beginning when they first told me I was in a uh, uh, I was in a what's it called uh, I was still in prison and I was in the, I still, they had gave me three more years because they wouldn't let me out. Barack told me they still, that he couldn't just immediately release me, so he gave me three more years because he's making them satisfy them. But I had filed another motion that would have knocked them three years off. But Barack had a pardon so I'm, I ain't thinking about the motion at the time. I'm going to do these three years on my head. I done did 20, I did 20. 26, 25 at that time. Man, this ain't finna ball. You know, I did the 28. They wanted me to do 30. I had did the 28. I had three more to go. Yeah, they are going to hit me with a straight 30. But then all of a sudden they called me. On, I was, and I had about six guys in my cell. I mean, I always been a joke or something. I got everybody laughing. They called me on the intercom. and said, Jerry, they you want to the captain office. Come right now. So I go to the captain. Now he tell me to turn around, put my hand behind my back. So I'm like, man, what I do, man? Let me, let me put your hand behind your back. You're going the hole. I go, man, what I done did? He said, I was just playing with you, man. He said, President Barack Obama just called and told us to give you immediate release right now. You got to go home. You got to get out of him right now. I'm going, whoa. <laughs> so they basically pardoned Jerry, told Jerry that he was going to be able to go home. The folk be hating so bad. They were like, look, you just got to do three more years. Barack Obama called back and said, nah, y'all let him out right now. He immediately released him. Let him go now. 
So I go, well, let me go back and get my stuff. They said, no, you can't never go back out there now because somebody scratch you, you got a light. You can sue the whole tape. You own the whole prison. You got to, they put me in the visiting room. I had to sit out there, and I had called my friend to come pick me up. So while I'm, 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 I'm scared to death now, I, they called me at 5.15, and it took them to 11.30 to come get me. So I'm not scared. I'm, I'm, I'm going, man, man, I, I want to walk home. What they tell me, man, ain't nothing down there but woods and deals and stuff. Man, you can't go down through that, man. I'm, I need to get out of there because they might have made a mistake. That's what I'm feeling. He said so, he's way out there in the man, woods, I'm standing man, out there I'm, in the woods. He arrived and take us so long. So, so, <laughs> he, wanted, he was scared. And so while I'm, <laughs> and so now I ain't, I'm, so while I'm in there, I'm sitting in the visiting room. They didn't lay the tip. They took the handcuff and everything. I'm free. She said, man, go outside the door. Man, you ain't seen outside in 28 years. I look at my mom, I'm still looking, I'm, I'm a little messed up now cause I'm going home. So I go to the door and I stick a feet out, jump back in the door. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, man, you trying to sit me or y'all trying to shoot me. Like, she said, man, you trying to go no, back man. out the door. So I step out again I put two feet. I jump back in. She said, man, you better go on out there. Man, nobody finna do nothing to you. I step all the way out the doors and that side. It's cold out there that night. Little dog, I play the little dog. I go back in, man. I'm sitting there, man, wild and my friend finally pull up. And I get in the car, man, the first thing I do when we come down the stay, I tell them to pull over. I get out, I go to a tree, put my arm around the tree and go, I kiss the tree. I get out and get on my knee and I, I kiss the ground. Cause man, I ain't think I was gonna never see this again. And I'm kiss the tree, I kiss the ground, we keep on riding, we come on back to make it. And I never heard of these right here. I never seen them, I seen two, the two guys that picked me up, they got these on the phone. But somehow everybody knew I had got out, so everybody calling their phone. And they pass these things to me and I'm going, man, what it did? I don't even know how to talk <laughs> in the man. Like, oh, you know what I live, if you could do this, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rotary <laughs> phone. Yeah, I'm yeah. dialing like that now. Now they got these, you don't know what they hear, man. And they just say something, I'm going, yo, yeah, what? Man, we hear you out, man. Everybody that start calling, glad you home, Jerry, glad you home, glad. I'm feeling good. I get to my in house, I lay down and go to sleep. Next day I wake up the house full of people. Ha. <sighs> man. What I, the first I, thing you ate? Oh man, I think she made some chicken, some collard green macaroni cheese, something like that. I can't even remember. I was so excited. I probably forgot, I forgot everything happened back in there. One, one, one of the times I I, I was a uh, short little time in jail and got out and was waiting on my friend to come pick me up, and they ain't show up on time. <laughs> you know, I man. walked like a, a mile and a half to the next <laughs> to, to the nearest store, at somebody to use their phone and. And, hey, I'm at the store now. <laughs> well, we said we was coming. Well, I can't even wait, bro. You can't you know wait, man. <laughs> I, had to, I had to get far away from that place. Man, man I was going, I ain't care about no deal, wolf, whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking them on, baby. I've been out of for 28 years. I just need to get out of there, man. Man, I ain't even think about cell phones, man. I did not think about the technology that changed. Yeah. Um, cars, you know, just the way people act. Um, what else other than cell phones was like something that kind of like was a shock to you that was just different? Or it could be somebody or like, you know, just. The, the makeup of the city. I didn't know why. I don't remember streets. I don't remember nothing. I still, I'm still like that now. She had to tell me, I go, what's I Describe somewhere that where it is. She had to tell me where it is and then it popped back in my head. Then I know where to go because everything to change. And when I bet that the chicken would run across the screen and when all the nothing out there been make them then. Yeah. I'm making like a, a big giant city now where they new interstate, new, yeah, everything new. Everywhere you go is new now. So it was like, it's making but it's still, I got places. It's still country, but it's but it's but remember, it's a yeah, city now. It's a city now. I don't yeah. know. You got to tell me, show me where I had to go now. So now I'm. I'm finally beginning to catch up. I'm still green. I'm finally beginning to catch up now, cause to look up in the sky and look around and tell myself, man, you know you free, man. I tell myself that every day. You could still, I got friends up there with six life sentences, three life sentences, four. They ain't never coming. I watch guys die in they cell. I watch, I watched all kind of stuff. A lot, a lot of guys ain't never coming up out of them. And that's that pain because they're good guys. It, them, them guys need a second chance. A lot of guys need a second chance. They ain't going to never, when you keep a guy in there that long, he done grew up in prison. He ain't going to never make them bad choices no more. He just need his chance. Like, I, I kept watching the, these guys go and come out. Same guy went out five times, came back, one go out six times. They just kept coming back, and I just needed that one chance. And that's what them guys and I need. They need that one chance. You'll never hear from them again. They're going to go do right. Well, a lot of them ain't gonna never get that chance. They're gonna die, no. Uh, so the 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 
date, not to make you think too much about going back, uh, I mean, being in that place, but what was the date that you went in and what was the date that you got out? That year? The year? I went in December 29th, 1989. I got out uh, January 17th. 19, I mean 2017, 2017. 2017, man. I saw you, no 90s. I like to miss a lot of the 20s. I was missing nine. I say no 90s. Yeah, man. There was a, there was a thing they had, you. Y2K, awesome. but we thought that the, the computer was going to take yeah. over, and yeah. we thought we was going to have flying cars by the I, time I, you I got out of here, Jerry. I was hoping they, they thought that, the world was going to end 2000. The computer did shit down in that way. The sales open up, the doors open up, to run up out of there and get out of that end. It didn't happen. <laughs> Oh man, man, what a story! Um, and you got the ability to tell it, um, direct it, John Claude, um, and God practically put it in your lap. Um, yeah, blessings true. to the beautiful Miss Ernestine. Um, Shout out Lanita, Lanita, Lanita. King, yeah. my wife Ernestine. Go, she been since I met her. I came, I had my own apartment. She booged all the way in. And she she been doing her thing and she been hunting people down, finding people doing and telling them about the story and whatever whatever she had to go, she would call in New York. Had, I got an article in New York. She had been them put out and and man, she just been doing her thing. She been working hard. She don't stop working. She so you got a, you got a producer, a publicist, a manager. I got all a that. Wife. I got all that. In best one. friend. Yes, all that's, that's, that that's the one. best way for them to be. If you ain't got that right there, you better get you another one. Yeah. Okay. Um. So this movie, Jerry. Just we just gonna call it just Jerry right what now. What they call it, Jerry? Um. Is it um. What are we looking like at, at on the release? Um, did we go on with Tubi? Uh, really? I don't think we're going to do Tubi. We don't want to really do none of that. So basically, we created a pilot. You know, most pilots short like, but this pilot is this, it's almost an hour. But Jerry's story is so long, you know, 48 minutes seem like something to everybody else. But really, man, it's just from the story you just heard. That's it's just a pilot. A, it's just, yeah. So basically, this pilot we've sent out to plenty of different you know, plenty of different people, different networks, different producers, and you know, production the, houses. Yeah. The goal, the goal is basically for somebody to take this, sit down, get the rest of Jerry's story, and to reshoot it. You know, so as of right now, that's why we haven't put it on Tubi or right. anything like that. We just, we just got it out where we got our own website, and for people who want to go click the link and look at what we created, you know, that's what we got, and that, that's what it's only for right now. Right, so Jerry the Short Film dot com. No, Jerry Short Film dot com yeah. um, is how you can go uh, check out the movie. Um, it's a it's a it's a rental fee, um, but um, let's talk about the cast, man. Uh, how 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 did you feel when you seen the person that was gonna be playing you, Jerry? We we met him up in Forsyth. Yeah, for the meet me up when he pulled up. Me and my wife walking down the street in the side jet walking, waiting on him and John. And when he, he came up in his he came up in his car, he was looking for me. And when he saw me, he just he told me, he said, time I saw you, he said, man, he said, wow. I knew it was you time I saw you. So we sat down and him started talking. I started telling him about it. He just, I blew his mind. He just, wow. Man, he been in love with me ever since I called him Lil Jerry. That name, man. <laughs> <laughs> he my son now. Lil Jerry. I mean, the, the, you know, there's there's a little bit of resemblance there, so that's why I was kind of interested. Um, yeah. And um, talk about more of, of the other of, of the cast, man. Um, uh, so, so um, the guy Lil Jerry, his real name is Joshua L. Eady. He's a great actor. He's been in plenty of films. He worked with people with the likes of 50 Cent, lots of people. So um, I don't like to rush the process of my characters and stuff like that. Like I said, a lot of times, like I really mean it. I let God work, but it just wasn't coming. It wasn't coming because originally Lance Gross was supposed to play Jerry. Okay. So um, Lance Gross' manager, he actually was a was the travel manager but he wasn't the entertainment manager mm -hmm. and he couldn't come through on what he actually said but you know that's why you got the alphabet you got all these other letters so you know i went to plans actually plan d but uh i had a friend his name's bobby huntley bobby huntley 
is a great director. He did um the uh, he did a lot of films and stuff like that. It's been on TV, a lot of stuff. So I hit up B Huntley and I was like, yo, man, look at this picture. This guy named Jerry Anderson. I was like, I need somebody to play Jerry. I said, you know, I know you're busy. I know you got a lot on your plate. I think he was um long story short, he just he he looked around, he sent me, he said, Man, look at this right here. This dude right here named Joshua. I think he can do it. And I reached out to Joshua. I had to sell it, convince him, talk to him, convinced him to come down to my hometown, got Jerry them to come to my hometown and had my family at the fair. I had everybody there at one time and we snuck off down the street to have a little meeting and and we grew from there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and uh, the girl who plays Temp, which is the chick that you see beside Joshua, uh, you know, that's that's the woman that, that actually taught Jerry the game that he spoke about in the interview. And um, she's from Ohio. Her name is Elizabeth Couch. She got a lot of TikTok followers, and she was, you know, she just played different characters and be different and be funny. And, like, I liked her personality. I had never met her before. And because uh, actually I had reached out to a few people. She's the only one that passed the test and came out to be dependable. So I was just like, all right, cool. And, you know, got her down here and she did everything she was supposed to do. Turned out good. How long did it take to shoot? Oh, man, I can't be precise on that. But, you know, I think we may have. To, how long y'all think? Yeah, like, you know, we. we going day by day here and there. We shoot here, shoot there. We, there we, were, we were doing a lot of shooting everywhere. A lot of time when I'm dealing with films, so like like when you got a big budget, you can go get you some real actors and big actors and you can put you an exact schedule together and people can commit to things because this is what they do. But a lot of times when I do my films, they get that full, full participation. Like, man, I go to the little towns and get the people of the community of where I'm filming. And, you know, uh, Lanita King helped me get a lot of the characters. Ernestine knew some people personally from the plays where they already had did and brought in some people. And Jerry had some people. And, you know, we just we just used our resources. And, and with those people not being real actors and still working, got families, we just, I would say, hey, all right, guys, we're going to come in. We're going to film on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And let's get as much done as we can. And then after that, let us sit down and look. And then I'll plan another date. We'll come back and we'll do it again. And, you know, we, we did that a couple times until we till we had what we needed. And then I look at the film when it's done and say, okay, we're missing this. We need to go and do this. And then, you know, we go do things until we get what we need, until we're satisfied with what we have. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the, the film. Um, the movie, I mean, the book even. Again, um, Jerry Anderson. King of Cocaine, yeah. 28 years, man, pardoned by Barack Obama, back on the streets from Macon, L.A., Philly, and back to Macon again. You know, you resurrected, my brother, and you, you know, um, and I'm sure that there's plenty on the list, um, but share with us a few things that you are playing on besides this film. Um, that you would like to, you know, this is a manifestation moment that um, we we just going to speak these things into existence if they're not all the way concrete. Or, if you know, if there's things that you don't want to share too much, what can you share about what the future may hold for Jerry Anderson? Well, one of my things I always wanted to do was go to Africa. Me and my wife just come from Africa last week. We were there for 25 days. I did a lot of shooting, a lot of things in Africa that I could put. I'm gonna put in I'm thinking about doing something on Africa. Uh, either put, I'm probably gonna put Africa in this when I get the movie done. When documentary. We, yeah, get the documentary, put Africa in there too. We got a lot of pictures, we got a lot of things that we wanna do with Africa. And I'm still got a lot of stuff in my head from from prison. I wanna shoot a prison thing, but what really happened in prison, what really go on in prison. And I also want to do, I got some more stuff in my head about, about movies that I'm going to get with Joe and with him. And sooner or later, we're going to sit and we work some stuff out. So I don't turn to like a producer on the slick yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. I ain't no turn to you. You, 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 you are that, sir. Yeah, y'all yeah, producers. And you have a wealth of ideas in your, in your mind um, that's just waiting to be created. Right. Um, and whether it be a, another collaboration with John Claude or, you know, or, um, another producer or director um 
it, it it'll take some time, but you know, keep at it. And and um, I, I see a lot of positive things coming forward. You've already been blessed um, to the utmost, and um, just I, I feel like God wants you on the streets and back in 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 your hometown for a reason. The little, and, the little kids, I, it just because a lot of little kids don't have no father in their life. A lot of little kids, mother ain't there, or she come there late, and a lot of little kids grew up by themselves in this. And I see that because, like I said, I, I go around the city, the brotherhood, the jams, and you and you get to talk to all these little kids, man, and they, they lost, man. Yeah. They just need somebody. They need guidance. When you, even when you teach them and show them the right way, they still go out there by Six, seven of these little kids now and talk to them and we get them jobs and we do stuff for them. Now they down in, in, in the, down in the LEC and make them prisons now with murders. All of them got murders on them. You can talk to them till they turn blue in the face. Tell them the wrong, you going up what way. The way you going, you ain't gonna never come back or you gonna get killed. And they still go out and still do them. Once they get with each other, they forget about what you say. And they start doing all that wrong stuff again. Now they down in the LEC with life centers. Finna get life centers, ain't gonna never come on. They got murders on. And they call on the phone saying, help, help. But I talked to you, I gave you everything. I told you now, man, you wasn't listening. A lot of people can't hear you, man. When you talking to some people, they can't hear nothing you saying. Some people got to go like me. I had to go to jail. Oh, you couldn't have told me to stop selling drugs. I wasn't gonna stop. Cause I was, my head was big, man. I had a and big that head. Money. Yeah, money, and, and but that not money. really the money. I just had a big head. Oh, you couldn't tell. I just feel like I was, like Jerry I told you, I was, man. I'm, I'm a wolf, and I'm just out. Everybody scared of me. So with Jerry, the, with Jerry, the money the wasn't nothing. It was just the power, the, the thing. I had a, a power thing about me that I needed to get that out of me. When I went to jail, my first three years, they, my first six years, twelve years, they let me back out. I did the same thing over again. So I had to stay there long enough to get that stuff out of my system. And when now I'm, my thing is now to talk to little kids, let them know you don't have to go to jail, man. You ain't got to go there and spend half your youth, uh, half your life in prison. You gonna go there, twenty, thirty, and come out in your forties and fifties, man. And some yeah. of you ain't gonna never come back because you gonna die and they'll get killed or something gonna go wrong. You just got to heal. And black kids don't heal. They, uh, they, they can't hear what you say, and that's the part you that get me that you can't hear me when I'm talking to you. I done did all this in, but you got to, you got to, like you got to go through this. Some of them do, and some of them, most of them gonna have to go through it. Yeah, man. Um, my father died in, in the federal penitentiary, uh, actually a holding holding building, um, and he had a life in the streets, uh, Miami, um, and. It just changed my life, um, seeing seeing all the fruits, and also seeing all the the bad despairs of what the streets have to offer. Hmm. Um, and from my mom and my dad, life being forever affected by the drug by drugs and the drug game. Um, you know, I, I I'm not a saint, but I I try to make sure I never went down the footsteps. My brother is a junior, and then he did eight years uh, for drugs, right? So I, I, it, it resonates with, with, with me, your story. It's, it's touching um, to me personally. And um, yeah, a lot of folks, it's just, it's just what we are introduced uh, to, but it's a lot. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to go down the same lane there's 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 other choices that can be made yes. and for for folks of course there is glorification and and the fascination with the life and what it, what it brings but also um it's good that you tell them both sides of the story it's good that you know for one you're a li- living testament of surviving um the uh, a story of like this and um yeah, I just feel like it's going to get bigger, you know, from just being just just a story about your life, but a story that can change many lives as far as your, your survival of this of this. So, um y'all go check out Jerry Anderson story, um also known as Jerry, yeah. directed, written um by Mr. uh John Claude, but I, I was thinking about your yeah, your name. You put your other name on the 
Nah, so so basically, you know what I'm saying? I'm John Claude. That's my uh, you know, that's that's my entertainment, that's my business, you know what I'm saying? But when you write them chicks, John Walton, them chicks right, go right. to John Walton. Right. But uh, you know, yeah, eleven ninety nine, Jerry the film out right now. Film is like forty seven minutes, but not only that, you get a documentary with it, shot by my boy Tony Fair. Uh, the documentary shows the making of the movie, how we made it. So not only do you get to watch the film after the film go off, like if you're into making film, an actor, actress, you know, you can actually sit back and watch how we made 2023, 2024 look like 1980, mm -hmm. 80 something. You get what I'm saying? Well, we got old school cars, old school clothes, but if the camera was just a little bit to the right, there's a 2023 <laughs> Maserati sitting right here. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So, and, and that was the funnest part about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, Jerry taking us into that world. Like, Jerry brought out clothes that he actually had back in the day when he was balling and rich and took them clothes and brought them for people to put on. Still had that stuff all the way to this day. MC Hammer Pan, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, you ever tried to find any of that money you buried? I plead the fifth. <laughs> I, I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, yes. Uh, Y'all go check that that, that that book out, man. King of Cocaine, The Life and Times of Jerry Anderson. Um, sir, I, I would love to hear more about your story. I look forward to, to checking out the film. Um, I'm, I'm going to go check that book out. And, that you know, book. once you, know, uh, you, you finish your tours and you get a lot of these things back, if you're ever back in Atlanta, you know, we can sit back and, and, and talk more about your, your, your family and, um, and life after um the other jerry you know <laughs> we gonna call him the other jerry you you, you a whole new jerry no, okay. now I'm, I'm really new jerry. you really is a right. whole new jerry jerry the the real jerry anderson right here in the flesh man and get um, that book man y'all go get that book y'all gonna love that go story and one more thing before we go man click on i want to say shout out to my brother howard ross hdr media howard ross shot and edited the film, Jerry. Yes. And, Shout out uh, to Rose, baby. My boy Ross, you know, he worked with everybody from, you know, he 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 he's done majority of two chains. He did all the Dolph, you know, um, all the way to this day. He does every graphic for Key Glock. He does everything in graphics and all that for Schoolie. You know, he did all the bankroll fresh. And uh Howard Ross is a great brother. You know what I'm saying? He's from DC. I known him for a long time and I hit him up and told him about the Jerry story and you know he was with it. Like while we was filming this movie, he was on tour with Key Glock. Some mornings, Ross would come film with us in Forsyth, leave Forsyth, ride to Atlanta, hop on a plane, fly to Colorado, film the tour, put the stuff up, go to the airport, get on a plane, go to Atlanta, sleep, wake up, and be two hours late why I got somebody else filming and then he come film. So that's that was took yeah. a lot of dedication. Shout out to Raw, baby. Shout out Brother to the Ross, Lita Players King too, cause she man, she who with my wife then my backbone. Yeah, man. They my get down. That them ain't no good, man. They get down for me. Took it long story short, it takes a team to do this. You know Take what I'm saying? Team. Currency, the new currency is basically togetherness, man. Unity. Yes. Unity. Unity is currency together. You know, I've been doing great for a long time by myself, but when you link up with the right team, you can get more done. And, yes. And that's how it go, man. Get that movie, man. Get that shot go film, get man. Get them books, man. Get that book, man. You're going to love Jerry. All right, can we watch the trailer before we get up out of here? Let's do it. All right, so we're going to watch the trailer to Jerry. Um, much blessings to you, Mr. Anderson, um, Mrs. Anderson. Um, thank you all for coming through, sharing your experience. Um the real, I I, I like the way you, you, the you got to it right away. Like you was like you know I, you know here here to talk about the real, but you know we ain't want to kind of get all all of <laughs> the the because I'm sure this you got storage for days, sir. For so sure. you're welcome yes. back anytime, man. We gonna thank um you. Thank, thank you for you. John Claude for bringing them through. Man, appreciate but let's y check out having us and and the Suttercon. We'll see you soon, my boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, DJ Decepticon, my partner, um, uh, couldn't be with us today, but he um, made sure that we was well prepared as far as um, to, to make this happen. So I appreciate yourself. I held, this, held it down for us. Word on the net. Special edition, the Jerry Anderson interview. Uh, thank you, sir. Let's watch this uh, trailer. Y'all go get the movie. 
jerryshortfilm.com. I said that right, right? jerryshortfilm.com. We're going to put the link on there, man. All right, Let's yeah, get. we got the, got the link. So y'all check out this uh, trailer we got here. And um, let's get it. How exactly did you get into the cocaine business? I had my first job at Georgia Power. That's when I first met Tim. Why you keep looking at me like that? Like what? Like that. Okay. The stuff we selling. What is it? Got these folk knocking at the door all the time of day and night. It's cocaine. It's a rich man's drug, and you can go to jail just by having this shit on you. This shit can either make your life or break it. I mean, but see, this is what niggas need on the street. You gotta get your own spot, cause see, when Temp be doing it, it be coming up short. You know, cause she be playing with a nose. Jerry? We're gonna take that, Jerry. You gotta do this shit right, all right? You know how we get down. I don't want no gambling, no shooting dive. None of that. You know you're type shit, alright? You know these dudes don't drink, they don't smoke. Yeah, but no, man. Get out! Get out! Where my money at? Get your money out! 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 We waiting on you. He would be none of this without me. Get up, gun! Let's go, get up, gun! Ain't nothing in there. Don't worry, I will fuck you, nigga. Go ahead on, Tim. Fuck you. Yes, sir. I'm looking forward to that. That's that's a good trailer, John. That's a good trailer, Mr. John Claw. All right. Um, so once again, that was the trailer to the Jerry, aka the Jerry Anderson story. Right now, go rent that. You will be hearing more from Mr. John Claw and his films. And also, once again, go get that book available right now on Amazon, The King of Cocaine, The Life and Times of Jerry Anderson. And this is Word on the Net Podcast. We'll see y'all next time.